So even though I'm in California right now, I love being able to do this with you. And, and we're so thrilled to have you. And in fact, Susan, I believe that you were the very first author we had when we opened the LaGrange store. I, was. I think you were our first yeah. one. You were and like what? our inaugural author event. I think it was and, a day or so. And hang on one second. The yeah. disembodied voice is back. You two have been chatting along happily. I do want to tell you we are now live on Facebook. So start <laughs> fresh. Mwah. Bye. We go start all over again. We're going to start yeah. all over again. That's it. Hey, I, I would be honored to introduce you twice. Um, do that same introduction you did before because it was really cool. Absolutely. <laughs> Folks, um, we're so happy to be here. I'm thrilled to be here with you. My name's Mary O'Malley and I work for Anderson's Bookshop in LaGrange. Um, I also have a Facebook page called Blurb Your Enthusiasm. I call myself a ridiculously enthusiastic bookseller and I get to showcase my ridiculous level of enthusiasm tonight because I am here with the incredible, amazing, entertaining, and uh, wonderfully famous Susan Elizabeth Phillips. And how lucky am I to be here with you? So I'm thrilled, thrilled. How lucky am I to be here with you? I mean, Mary, you are one of those booksellers who really reads and who's always shoving books into people's hands. That's my favorite thing. I love it so much. And your store, if you didn't hear us earlier, because we thought we were on, we weren't. Anyway, the, this, uh, the uh, Mary store is in LaGrange, Illinois. There are two other Anderson's bookshops. One is in Naperville, one is in Downers Grove. They're incredible independent bookstores. And the LaGrange store is the newest store. Um, and it is a beautiful, beautiful store. That's, a, the, I love that whole stretch of, is it Main Street that it's on? It's LaGrange Road and it's very Mayberry. It is at what great restaurants, places to just hang out. It's, it's a wonderful location. So I'm delighted Thank to be you. with you. Well, and I was saying that um, when we opened this location, Susan was our inaugural author event, uh, the very first author that we hosted there. And um, it was then I learned, you know, that that you're a huge partner with Andersons. And uh, that's just, that's so great. And I know that people watching tonight, um, so we're here, we're here to talk about Dance Away With Me which is Susan's forthcoming book, which is releasing on June 9th, which happens to be my 30th wedding anniversary. Um, and so we're, we're thrilled to be here talking about it. And I know that people are going to want to know uh, how they can pre-order it. And I'll tell you, if you pre-order this book from Anderson's Bookshop, uh, you will be able to get a signed personalized book plate uh, that Susan will personalize however you want. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll go over all the steps for that, you know, as we close up, if that's okay for anybody who, you know, kind of trickles in a little later. But yes, if you buy this book from Anderson's Bookshop, pre-order it, um, you'll be able to request a personalized book plate for yourself or a friend or a mom or an aunt or a daughter or anybody who loves Susan's work. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a little bit, but you know, I, I wanted to start out, I've got some, um, some questions and I will let you know that my daughter is a, one of your biggest fans and she's a romance blogger and reviewer. And I had her vet my questions for tonight. Cool. And she, she deemed them um, entertaining, engaging, and interesting. So All right. I poured wine, Mary. And the reason it's not, it's in a like this kind of a glass instead of a wine glass is because I knew if I put in a wine glass, I would spill it all over my keyboard before we were done. And that would be good. So, wow, I'm ready. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. I have my bubbly drink. So I, you know, over the past week or so, you've kind of been on a, a little bit of a pre-pub tour. And, you know, unfortunately it's got to be, um, it's got to be virtual instead of in person. And right. um, that's, it's you different. Know, it's, it's, I feel, I have mixed feelings about this. I love being able to connect with readers 
and, and get those hugs and take the pictures. I mean, I feed off that, right? But the one thing about these virtual tours is I really get to connect with so many more readers um, in the first place. And the other thing is um, I don't have to leave home. I don't have to get on a plane. So the lazy me loves it, but I, I do miss, I miss the hugs, but I love being able to connect with so many readers. Well, and Doreen wants you to know that your hair looks great. <gasps> All the great coming up. No. <laughs> and Careful. Linda Foote wants to know, Linda wants to know, is it hot in California? Yeah, uh, we're, I'm on the um, little balcony patio of our place and it's been freezing all day. I was bundled up in sweaters riding out here and now the wind has died down and I'm warm. So there you go. By the way, thank you to all my friends on Instagram who voted on which earrings I was supposed to make wear. Tonight. I couldn't make up my mind, so I asked them to vote and these won. Well, they're adorable. I can yeah, see they, why they won. That cost me $8 too, so there you go. Yeah, yeah. I've got little books. Oh, oh, those are so cute. I wore them just for you. Thank you. My little books. So I got an early copy of your book um, so I could read it before we chatted. And I found myself as I was reading, and this was part laziness, part just I didn't want to lose a train of thought, but I dog-eared and I wrote in the I galley. I love that. I know some people think books are pristine and they shouldn't, you shouldn't do that but I love it. I'm so glad. I'm so glad I had to fess up and I wasn't sure how you were going to feel about it. So I'm, I'm glad I have your blessing. Yeah. Some of those people, some of my readers are very upset with you right now though. I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, well, PJ is waving from North Carolina and we have Adriana from Vancouver Island. Um, Holly in Naperville says hi. Hi Holly. Laura in Northwest Indiana says, Hey, uh, oh my gosh, Cynthia from Costa Mesa, California. And then we have uh, Enyer all the way from Germany. So we've got wonderful, great people here watching and that's so great. Uh, so I wanted to tell you though, as I got into reading, I did not get very far before I had this incredible urge to drive to Tennessee <laughs> and eat some bruschetta in a little cabin. Um, oh, and Kitty LeBeau says, hi, that's my daughter. She said, hi. Hey. Um, so I need to know why Tennessee? How did you find yourself there for this book? I've written two books uh, in um, Tennessee. Natural Born Charmer was one of them. And I, I needed, because the heroine of this book, we have this really deeply grieving young widow. She's a former midwife and she's hiding away in this little cabin above the town of Tempest, Tennessee. I wanted a remote area and a rural area. Um, I like writing in Southern states because, you know, if you write in a Southern state or you write in Texas, you can make anything happen and readers will buy it. To all my friends, you know, all my friends out there in the South, you know, this is true. Um, and I had also written Natural Born Charmer in the state of Tennessee. So I think initially I had hoped that I could bring the characters from National Born Charmer at least in for a walk on. That did not turn out, but that was one of the, the factors that played in. I like writing in North, about North Carolina, I like writing about Tennessee. I did Ain't She Sweet in Mississippi. And then of course the Chicago Stars books, a lot of them are set in my hometown. Lovely, lovely. And so your love interest, a street artist, um, that it really lent it, oh my gosh, it formed the character so beautifully. How did you get inspired to, to you know, turn a street artist into your, your main character, your love interest? When um, I like, I have written um, heroes before who were involved in the arts. I've written writers and I've written artists before. And I'm very attracted to writing about that and the creative process. I kind of didn't intellectually realize how much I liked writing about that until I sort of started thinking about, well, you've done, you've done this kind of thing before. So I knew the guy was an artist, but I didn't know what kind. And I was talking to my son, Zach, who I actually interviewed on my Facebook Live page. And um, I said, Zach, I, you know, this guy is just, so fascinating to me and he's an artist but I don't know what kind and he said mom 
street art. That's where it is. And in my mind, street art meant graffiti. And even though I am an art and museum, art museum junkie, I didn't know a lot about street art. So I plunged into this whole world of, of everything from, from tagging graffiti on subway cars all the way to these unbelievable murals. And I'd always been fascinated by the, that great British street artist, Banksy, right? Yes. Uh, digging into his work. And then I thought, oh, this guy is the American Banksy. So this opened up a whole new world of art appreciation. As a matter of fact, in my travels the last couple of years, I've taken photos wherever I've been of street art that I've stumbled on. And I just, I re, I've forgotten I had them. I've got to put them up on my website. Um, so this was this perfect idea for the guy who started out as this rogue street artist, but now he's in his late thirties. His days of youthful rebellion are over, but he has all of these accolades. Everybody thinks he's the greatest American street artist. He's moved into being paid for his work, murals, but it, it doesn't resonate with him anymore. He mm -hmm. is, this isn't who he is anymore. He's lost for a number of reasons. The heroine is lost for her own reasons too. Mm -hmm. These are two people who need each other, but do not know it. Yeah. And that kind of resistance and churn between characters is something I love writing about. I love writing about how they're going to find their own strength within themselves and with each other. And in this case, they have to be able to work together because another human life is at stake. The little baby who appears in the book. So um, that's kind of the dynamic, but the street art was such a bonus. I just love the research on that. I, I loved reading about it. I really did. Um, Lori Jensen is on her couch. She misses the store, but she's glad to be safe at home. And um, Linda would like to know, with all of your world travels, uh, do you have any more international stories in the works? I only wrote one real story in, um, inspired by my travels, and that was Breathing Room. I was in Italy, I was in hiking in Tuscany, and I got the idea for that book and was able, as we finished as, as finish the hikes, I'm on the hiking trail with paper and this ratty little notebook trying to write down everything I can while I try not to, uh, to uh, trip on tree roots and fall on my face. But Interestingly, Dance Away With Me actually has European roots, even though it has nothing to do with that. I was on a hiking trip in Sicily and I was in this, it wasn't a, very, it wasn't a nice hotel room. Um, it was kind of cramped. And I woke up in the middle of the night with this dream about a 1950s Sicilian midwife. And you know, in my, you know how when you wake up, something seems like a great idea, even when it isn't. And so I'm plotting out getting this whole idea. And then when I woke up, I'm when I'm going, I don't think you can write about 1950s Sicily, but the idea stuck with me and ended up being the base idea that I created this book from. So it does that's, have Sicilian roots. That's the amazing. The heroine amazing. actually is Greek, but... <laughs> And, and June 9th, again, just for anybody who's just joining, is when this comes out. And we'll go over how to order it uh, at the end. But Susan, I tried to look up exactly how many books you've written. I asked my daughter. She wasn't quite sure. Every site I went to gave a different answer. So I, I need to hear from you how many books. I don't know. I think Mr. Bill said this was 24. I don't. 24. I think the reason... It's, there's a confusion is because the very first book I wrote in collaboration with my friend and that book is out of print. So whether or not that one shows up, it, it, the number changes with every book. I can't, I don't remember. That, that, well, so that goes to my, my next question, which is how do you, with 23, 24 books, how do you keep track of the stories, the characters, the names, the plot lines, do your readers help you with that? I, you know, who in your world helps you? Is that keep information? Track? Oh, the, I discovered this years ago. It's called the Lazy Writers Research. I hop on my Facebook page. I say, who's reading whatever the book it is? But I remember one time um, I needed to know if Dan and Phoebe Calebo, who were the heroes, uh, hero and heroine of my first book, 
it had to be you if they had a swimming pool in their yard. Hopped on and within five minutes, somebody was reading that book and came back and told me the information. There was also something else I can't remember now that I inquired about, laziest research ever. Uh, but I can get an answer from my, from my friends on Facebook within five minutes. Wow. Because when, especially when I started, Dance Away With Me is a standalone book, but when I started the Chicago Stars books, the Wynette Texas books, they were never intended to be a series. So I did not have any kind of a, a document that traced characters and jersey numbers and all those kinds of things from the very beginning, um, which I wish I had. But now, I, you know, I could go back and do it, but I'm thinking, eh, why bother? Right, right. <laughs> so um, we have Avis Mael, who's a quilter, and she reads your books cover to cover uh, via Audible while she quilts and loves your stories and, um, you know, loves to, to, the narrators play a big part in that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you choose your narrators? Is it the same one? Uh, I've had a couple of narrators. My first narrator, the one everyone had fallen in love with, Kate Fleming, um, unfortunately died in a horrible, horrible accident. And mm -hmm. that was just a blow for all of us. Uh, Nicole Poole has been, um, has been the narrator on the last, the last few books. And I've gotten a lot of questions about the Audible book. It will be out the same day as um, as the book comes out, it'll be available June 9th. Okay. Audible, our, our um, audiobooks are just playing a bigger and bigger part in for readers. Um, I think there's first, it's the idea of having somebody tell you a story. That's a very powerful kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But also the um, just the idea that people are want to do everything. They want, they're doing other things and they, yes. you know, we have long commutes. I have a friend who's a knitter, quilters, they love the United States Post Office. I have a lot of people who listen to books at the United States Post Office. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Our mailman at the bookstore, every day he comes in, he's listening to an audio book. Really? He gets them through his library. Um, and he'll, he'll tell us, in fact, you'll love this. He's, you know, he's a middle-aged guy. Uh, you know, we got, you know, got to know him just because he comes in every day. And a couple of months ago when he came in, I said, you know, Gus, what you listening to? And he goes, oh, I got this, this latest one. You know, I heard so much hype about it. So I thought I'd listen to it. I said, what is it? He said, 50 shades of gray. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say anything. Uh, he goes, I'm, I bet there are a number of men who listen to that book. <laughs> I, I said, how far are you? He goes, oh, it's, it's just at the beginning. And I thought, I don't know if I want to be here to make eye contact as he gets further <laughs> into that when he comes through. Uh, so a couple more questions. We have, uh, um, Anna wants to know if you prepare a detailed outline of your books when you start writing. You know, there, there, are, different, there are different schools of writing. Some, my friend, Susan Mallory, um, she has everything outlined. She has the scenes broken down. She does all this before she starts writing. So she has that story whole in her mind. Uh, people like myself, my, my buddy, Jane Ann Krentz, uh, so many others, we don't tend to do that. Um, usually I have just a premise mm -hmm. and, or the idea for a character and I type chapter one and then I sit there and I go, what happens now? So I'm discovering the book as I write it. It is not an efficient way to write. Uh, it's uh, really, really messy because the way it works is, you know, I'll write chapter one, then I'll start in chapter two, then I have to go back and rewrite chapter one and on to two, and then I have to rewrite one and two. I mean, it takes forever uh, because you're creating as you go along, but sure. it's it is my process and I have made peace with it. It means I'm not the fastest writer around, but um, I just love exploring and discovering the story as I'm writing. Mm -hmm. That's that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, somebody wanted to know about the quarantine scene you wrote. Oh, that's hysterical. So I get this email from Assistant Sharon uh, a couple of weeks ago and she said, you wrote a quarantine scene. Do you remember which book it was in? And I wrote her back and I said, no, I've never written a, a quarantine uh, scene, okay? A few hours pass and she sends me the scene and it was in my book, um, What I Did for Love. 
Oh my gosh. And it was the hero and heroine and an ex and his person are all quarantined together for SARS. They're in this SARS waiting period. I thought, I could not believe I did that. So Sharon's the other one that helps keep you uh, apprised of what you've written. Exactly. And, you know, one other thing I was thinking about with, with Dance Away With Me is we have um, a really interesting family in here, a family of survivalists. And uh, the hero and heroine make a few jabs at them because um, of the catastrophes they're hiding from. And I think I made a reference in here to them worrying about a world pandemic. Oh, well. <sighs> There you have it. Did you see that uh, one coming? <laughs> none of us did. None yeah. of us did. Um, all right. So we have a couple other questions, but I, I just wanted to say, you know, I run the events um, at the LaGrange store and it became, became very clear to me right away that romance authors and their readers have a really special and tight bond. I mean, it's, it's just... I, I always, when I look at the events calendar and I'd see a romance author coming in, it filled me with joy because it's so wonderful to see the interaction and everybody there is just joyful to be together. Um, do you think that that is unique to the romance genre? Uh, it's, a, it's a girlfriend bond. It is absolutely unique. And what is really interesting to me is I, because I'm published internationally, I've toured in Germany a number of times. I've toured in Spain, Croatia, Slovenia, Italy. It is the same everywhere. When I walk into those events, my Italian readers, my German readers, my Croatian readers, it's girlfriend time. And I think part of that is that um, readers who are attracted to romance in general are attracted to books about community and love and families. Um, they're not necessarily the readers that are um, looking for gore and horror. And, you know, I, I mean, and I'm not putting down readers who like those genres, um, but I don't see so much of that with the romance readers. They are primarily women. They're always, there are always a few men there, but they're primarily women. And in, um, in my US events, I see a lot of older women there with their daughters. In my European events, I see a lot of younger women there with a few mothers in tow. Oh, That's the only big difference. But yeah, we're girlfriends. Yeah, and well, nothing, you've got there's, Sam. There's nothing that romance readers love more than standing in lines and telling everybody around them which books they have to read. Yes. Which authors, you've seen that. And then they'll I've go and pick up four books. Yeah. Yes. And you've got, it's so funny because Sam from Japan wants you to know that uh, they love the twists in your books. Nice. So here it is in action. You're talking about this international uh, community of, yeah. of people who, um, who just love the, the genre. That's so, so cool. And not only with you and your readers, but I've also had the pleasure of see you, seeing you interact with other romance authors and the way you will take a new debut romance author and build them up and make them feel comfortable about what they are doing. I've seen you, there was one event, we had a romance panel at LaGrange, there was one brand new author and you had gone to dinner with them. And then you just came in and you, you moderated the whole thing. You took it over and I was, I, it was just so much, it was so joyful to watch. But I um, love doing yeah, that. For these I new love it. Yes, you've done that for these new authors. Did you early on have anybody who kind of mentored you and took you under their wing? Well, in a way, yes, because there were romance conferences early on with Romance Writers of America and with Romantic Times where I immediately formed these friendships and with fellow writers. And those friendships have carried me through the years. We all have this common experience. We know what, what it feels like when you just don't know where you're going in your book. We know how to tell everybody, each other to snap out of it. So yeah, I did have that. And I also love being able to um, help younger writers or any, any romance writers, because I believe that a high tide 
floats all ships, that the more readers who discover the genre, they're going to buy my friend's book, they're going to buy my book. And it's a good business sense too. So I really, really love that. The other thing about romance readers that's so interesting is they, so many of them read widely. They will hop from literary fiction to a Harlequin romance. Um, they'll, they'll hop with nonfiction. They're readers. They're really big readers. Yes. I, I couldn't agree. My, my daughter's collection, I think she has over 800 romance novels. Um, each time they move, the first thing she has to look for is where her bookshelves will from. go. <laughs> um, absolutely. All right. So we have L Linda who wants to know, she says, uh, she knows you aren't into books being made into films, but she would love to see First Lady done. Um, it's very timely. And it, there's a, a question that maybe Lydia is your sister? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> the books into movie thing, wouldn't we all love to see a movie of First Lady? This is where the First Lady runs away from the White House in disguise. Um, We'd all love to see that, but we want to see the movie of the book. And what we have seen time and again is the, that film and books are two different media. And so we don't get to see the book that's played out in our, that, that has played out in our head as we're reading. And so often you end up with disappointed readers who they don't com complain to the, the production people. They complain to the author, right? Yes. And uh, the idea of turning over some of my books, I would have to have a lot of trust. I mean, you look at what's happened with Diana Gabaldon's Outlander series. That's fantastic because they had this big canvas to do these big, big books. But how often does that happen? I can't wait to see what happens with Julia Quinn's Bridgerton series. Uh, that's going to be interesting because Shonda Rhimes is behind that. Mm. And um, Virgin River, Robin Carr's Virgin River series has just been a huge hit. They've they have a second season of it going. So I like the idea of these Netflix uh, where you have a space of time and you're not trying yes. to do an entire book in a, you know, a two hour film, but still it's not going to be the same as the book. Yeah. And I apologize. It's Linda, not Lydia. Your sister is Linda, right? No, no. My sister's Lydia. You had it oh, right. Okay. Okay, very good. I wanted to make sure I got her name right. Uh, Donna works at the post office and she loves listening to your books. Um, Olympia is asking, what genre are your books? Uh, I love that question because I have always written this and the, more recently, my books straddle the line between romance and women's fiction. I don't completely fall into other each camp because I tell a bigger story uh, than a lot of romance novels do in terms of there are many more uh, secondary characters and relationships, but a lot of women's fiction can get very, very depressing. Um, and you want to kill yourself when the book's over. I promise readers that I will never do that to them. I don't want to read that. I don't want to write it. So yes, my books do straddle that line between romance and women's fiction. I love reading books like that. And I love writing them. It's a really comfortable place for me to be. Oh, and Holly wants everyone to know that she's been reading your books for 25 years. She loves you, loves your books. They're fantastic. And you are the nicest person ever when you're not stirring up trouble, when you're <laughs> not Holly, stirring up trouble. When I'm not stirring up trouble. Holly's also an Anderson person. She shops there. She's a local girl. Yeah. She's been a reader from the very, very beginning. Uh, I still have readers that um, discovered me when I was just starting out that are, that are still around. And I just love that. That means a lot. That's wonderful. And Frederica is watching from Austria where it's 1 a.m., Oh, um, oh my so goodness. gosh, how lovely that, I, and we've got Japan, Austria, Germany, Canada in the house right now, but she wants to know if you're going to write a Chicago Stars again. You know, I always, every Chicago Stars book I say is my last Chicago Stars book, and then I get an idea. Uh, so you never say never. 
never say never. But I've always said with the Chicago Stars book is I have to have a great idea. I love that series and I won't do anything in it that just really doesn't feel right. I won't write a Stars book just to say I wrote the Stars book. And I'd like to do a special hello to my friends in Germany. Um, the Dance Away With Me is coming out. I don't remember the exact date, but it's very close. To, it's in June. And I'm hoping I can get over to see you in November. I don't know that for sure if we're going to be able to do that. But you will have uh, Dance Away With Me available in Germany in June. Yay. And we have, so I, I have a couple of questions. I'm going to segue back to the the uh, the audience. But I this is one that just came up to me as I was reading your book. And I just need to know what is your favorite type of sex scene to write? What situation do you just, you sit down and you're like, oh, I get to write this guy and this woman doing, what is that for I, you? I don't, I never ever write a love scene that's not intrinsic to the plot. It has to reveal something about plot or character. Otherwise, it is boring. And a lot of readers out there know what I'm talking about. They hit a love scene. It's like been there, done that, and they skip through to get to the action. I don't want anybody to ever skip my love scenes, not because it's particularly titillating. I mean, there's so many writers who write much more explicitly than I do, mm -hmm. but because it's going to reveal something about what is happening with those characters. So if I can't do that, you're not going to have a love scene. But That's, there is a pretty good one in this book. Yes. yes I there like is. that scene. I really thought it did everything I wanted to do. Oh, it, yeah, I loved it. I loved it. And Ann Richardson is a high school teacher, and she she would like to know um, you as a career writer, what advice that could she pass on to her students about writing and what you just said about the the love scene, you know, that plays into that very nicely. Well, I'm a former high school teacher. And one of the things I like to do when I talk to teenagers is say, get a spiral notebook, sit down and write in it. Don't worry about where a comma is. Don't worry what spelling, just write your heart out. Don't think about getting published, just write and write and write. Um, I'd like to see kids have that freedom to just be able to do that. You don't, have, don't show it to anybody. Just keep writing. And if maybe it's a couple sentences here or there, maybe it's a paragraph. Um, maybe it makes sense, maybe it doesn't. Who cares? Just sit down and write and enjoy that process. Yeah, I, I have heard that from so many authors and you as a former teacher and now you know the author of your caliber to be just reiterating that advice. Yeah. Um, that's, that's just amazing. Uh, Heidi's a librarian from Baltimore and she reread all of your books during quarantine. Oh, Heidi. <laughs> what a great quarantine activity. Uh, you know, Mary, um, I am finding out, I've heard of, from a lot of readers who are rereading all my books and I've heard, talked to other writers and they're hearing the same thing from their readers. They're rereading all of their books like Jane Krentz and people like that. Sure. And I think right now we're seeing a lot of people who, who want comfort reads. Uh, with all the stress we're under, we don't want more stress in our reading. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's interesting that she posted that because I'm seeing that again and again, all of us are with our, with our readers that they, that they want to go to that safe place at those books again. I love that. Absolutely. It's the closest thing we have to being able to spend time with our, our friends and our family and our loved ones, you know, our, for me, and I'm sure I'm not the only reader who feels that way. You know, our books are our friends. They're our companions. Yes, they um, are. So of course. Uh, and so with your books, how, and we talked you know, we were talking about how do you keep track of your characters and your scenes mm -hmm. and your plots how do you come up with the names for your characters? Gosh, I, the name has to feel right. I have lists and lists of weird names and common names. I don't like, I try not to name any character after anybody that is really close in my life because that, you know, messes me up. Um, and sometimes I give the, a character a wrong name. That happens frequently. Matter of fact, I think it happened in this book and I can't remember now. That's a good question. I'm gonna to have to think about that. I'll put it on my Facebook page when I can remember. The name I had chosen just wasn't right. I know he was in 
Hamilton Lodge. And for some reason, I could not let that, you know, and I could have done things with that whole notion of lodge, but it, sure. it, it wouldn't fit. And for me, I had to change it to North. He's Ian Hamilton North the fourth. And that fourth is really important to the process of the story. It is, absolutely. Um, and so that's your characters, but how did you come up with this title? Oh, this book we could not come up with a title. Uh, we tried all kinds. I wanted to call it The Runaways. Well, there's a lot of books out there with that title, their series that was causing trouble. And so um, I, I, my editor, Carrie Farron, said, I wish we could do something with dance. And oh man, I tried everything with dance. And Mr. Bill's usually good with titles. He was coming up with nothing good. I was coming up with nothing good. We were at a, on a family vacation and I started brainstorming with, um, with my family. And um, my, one of my granddaughters started throwing out just ridiculous dance titles. And it was just, it, it deteriorated by the minute. I went up to go to bed <laughs> and uh, my cell phone pinged and it was my daughter-in-law texting me and she said, dance away with me. My daughter-in-law Leah came up with the title. And there and it was. was. Oh, I waited till the next morning, texted editor Carrie, and we said, yeah, that's it. So that one was lucky, but man, it was an ugly process getting there. And it's just oh so goodness. perfect because she's trying to dance away from her circumstances. She's trying to dance away her feelings and all through yeah. she dances sometimes in rage and in sorrow. And they're all there's all this emotion that goes into her dancing. Mm-hmm. And looking backwards, I mean, the title is, is so obvious, but <laughs> yeah, where were you when I needed you? <laughs> Hit me up next time. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, just a, a couple more, one more question that I have kind of about your process and romance. And is there anything off limits when you're writing your books, any, any subject or any situations that you're like, you know what? I just won't go there or oh yeah there are there it, I mean it, there's a whole raft of things I don't want to write about if it, it's something that I don't know if I have a feeling I mean it's something that I, I can't understand through research um, then I probably wouldn't be comfortable writing about it okay. uh, some experiences maybe that I can't imagine uh, and I'm not going to write anything that's really ugly just because I don't, I don't want to spend, it takes me, you know, almost two years to write a book. I don't want to spend two years in that kind of murk. So yeah, they're sure. definitely like that. Wow. Okay. We have Korea. Uh, somebody from Korea is here. Um, and Jadziri from Mexico would like to know when the Spanish translation will be out. Like Rosebud. I don't think I just talked to the the uh, agent who sells my foreign rights. I don't think Spain's bought this book yet. So okay. I'm yeah I'm a little bit concerned about that. Um, and we have an inquiry in, and when I have more information about the Spanish uh, a Spanish language edition, but it looks like it's going to be a while if they haven't even bought it yet. I mean, what's up with that? So yeah, it's crazy. I, I, yeah. My, my Sp I know my Spanish language readers are not going to be happy about that, but just to, I want you to know I'm on it. I'm working on it. Excellent. And Kristen Hanna says hi. Oh, hi. The great. No, that is the great Kristen Hanna. Um, oh I God. so. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. I got friends. I got friends. This is Kristen Hanna of the Nightingale, the Great Alone. I um, love the Great Alone. Oh, right. Oh amazing she has um the nightingale is they're getting ready to film that they finished filming her book firefly lane and um her new book is called four winds they she just revealed the title not that long ago but i knew it even before and amazing author and an amazing human being i can't but i know i can't believe anybody out there hasn't read Kristen hannah oh my gosh and she's a just a delightful human being she is um so a couple more questions, and then we're going to go back to how people can order the book. Uh, but are there any books coming out soon that you're excited about? And what are you reading right now? The, um, I just read the new Kristen Higgins. Kristen's book, Kristen Higgins' book is coming out the same day as mine. Oh, 
sorry, what? I cannot read. There are four birds on the cover and I have just gone blank. I'm sorry, Kristen Higgins. Um, anyway, but you can, you can easily Google it coming out. Um, Always the last to know. I think that's the title. Anyway, love that book. I've got the new Susan Mallory I'm reading right now. Um, so lots and lots of good stuff coming out for summer. Oh, and I have the, um, the uh, Mary Kay Andrews, unfortunately got shipped to my, ha to my house instead of here. That's going to be waiting for me, a huge reward when I get home. Oh, absolutely. That's a wonderful reward. Um, Pam Jaffe says hi. Hi, Pam. And um, so... We're going to get to how people can pre-order this book and get a signed book plate. And I know we kind of, we started out with this and I just would like to reiterate, you know, in, in today's world uh, with everything going on, indie bookstores have really taken a hit and it has been, um, it has been a struggle, but you, you have had this ongoing decades long, beautiful relationship with Anderson's bookshop and why, you know, why are indies important? Because in an indie store, you can meet booksellers who've read books. And this is what happens when I walk into Anderson's. Matter of fact, I mean, I've been at a couple of social occasions with you guys. And in a social occasion, it's all books. You've got to read this. You've got to read this. And I'll say, well, I don't know if I'd like that particular. Oh, yes, you will. You, yes, you will. You, that kind of hand selling, it, you're only going to find that in independent bookstores. Mm -hmm. And Anderson's is just one of the very best. So you guys keep it together because you're going to be able to open up soon. Things are going to get back to normal and we need you. Thank you. And we are open for curbside and internet orders um, and pre-orders. So that is my, my little segue right there. Uh, so in order, if you would like to pre-order Susan's book from Anderson's in order to get a signed and personalized book plate, um, there's a couple of things that, that you need to know. You go to our website, you click on featured pre-orders because Susan is always a featured pre-order. Um, click on her book. And uh, number one, please don't order anything else with the pre-order. I, I know that's kind of a pain and I apologize. Our system just isn't, you know, we're, we're overwhelmed with the internet orders right now. And we wanna make sure that Susan's readers get their books and their book plates in a timely manner. So if you're pre-ordering Susan's book, go to our website. Don't order anything else. Um, on that get, order. You can order. On that order. On that order. Go back <laughs> afterwards yeah. and order. But on that specific <laughs> order, only order Susan's book. Um, once you go through all of the, you know, click and then um, go to your cart and check out and all that kind of thing. Um, at the very bottom, there'll be comments for your okay. order. Yes. And in the comments, you can put, please personalize, um, happy Sign anniversary. To, to Mary, well, you can say to Mary, to Jane, or if you want, if you're putting away for a Christmas present, you know, to Aunt M, please say Merry Christmas or happy birthday. But you have to go to the comments section and write that in. Otherwise, you'll get a book plate, but it'll just have my signature on it. Yes. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, normally if this had, had hit, I would have gone in the store and been able to actually sign the book, but we're signing the book plates. They're these beautiful, just big, nice William Morrow book plates. And I'm going to sign them as soon as I get my list. Um, can you hand me one, Susan? You want one? I would. Okay. Oh, see, let me give it. Oh. Here you go. Oh, I've you got one? it. I've got it. Oh. And look. Signed? It, it, let me open it up to, uh, let's see. Look at that. <gasps> a signed book plate to Mary. Oh. Happy reading. Happy reading, Mary. <laughs> well, that is what you'll get. Susan, I can't tell you what a delight it has been to spend time with you. Um, you're just, you're a ray of sunshine for all of us. And right now that's so needed. So thank you for letting me be here. Thank you, Mary. It was a pleasure to be with such a good reader and such a great bookseller. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys. <laughs>